as some of you may be aware, I, at the end of last year, took uh, a leap away from academia and got offered a position at Zeiss. And I have an interesting role there uh, where I'm not actually involved in selling any instruments. My, uh, my role is a science role to kind of make sure that the instruments do the things that, that we as geoscientists want to be able to do and the, the direction that the development of those instruments and the software uh, goes in is something that's useful to geoscientists. So we're very lucky we've got uh, three geoscientists uh, working in this group. Uh, there's uh, a mining specialist, an oil and gas specialist, and then myself. So my job is to serve academic, uh, the academic geoscience community, so departments, museums, uh, surveys, etc. And what I'm going to show you today is now that I've been able to get my hands on some some fancy instruments and play around some of the things I've been doing with metamorphic samples. Uh, so I'm not really going to specifically show you uh, a field area or, or, or a single story as such, but, but try and whet your appetite for the kinds of projects that might be possible and things that I would like people to come and talk to me about, about what they would like to be able to do with, with these kind of instruments. So the thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, an SEM uh, instrument and software uh, called Zeiss Mineralogic. And so first of all, I'll just tell you what mineralogic actually is. So this is something you should be quite familiar with in a lot of geoscience departments, so an analytical SEM uh, for imaging and microanalysis. Uh, it's a fairly flexible setup, so you can put mineralogic on, on just about any SEM setup from tungsten filament SEMs to, uh, to field emission systems with a variety of different detector solutions. But the important things that I'm going to talk about here are uh, that Zeiss Mineralogic combines the ability to do automated mineral mapping alongside quantitative EDS analysis. So this provides quite a unique solution uh, for a lot of uh, petrology and geochemistry tasks that we, that we get on with. And a big part of what I've really tried to do for many years is, is get better at correlating different types of data. And, and one of the ways that we can do this, obviously, is to try and collect more different types of data on, on a single instrument. And that's really what, uh, what Mineralogic is doing here. So just to give you an example about the automated mineral mapping, this is something that you may be familiar with from a variety of instruments. So the example I've got here is uh, a classic rock type, if you like. It's a, a metagabro from Scarry Moor in the Louisian. It's got a uh, fairly well equilibrated granulite fasces mineral assemblage, which makes it quite easy to demonstrate some of the things I'm going to be talking about. And when we run this through Zeiss Mineralogic, what we get is a backscatter map. So you can see here the fault intersection mapped in backscatter. And then we get this phase map. And the thing that's different about this phase map compared to some other instruments is that the, the mineral library that we create in Mineralogic uh, is based on the quantitative geochemistry. So we're not using um, the intensity to the relevant peaks. What we're pulling in from the EDS detectors is the mineral chemistry itself. And this enables us to uh, much more clearly identify the different mineral phases and also uh, deal much more easily with things that haven't been classified instantly because we don't just get um, a, a sort of range of different peak intensities that we then have to interpret. You get whatever the chemistry is of your unknown phase that you can take away and look up. And this is particularly useful for, for students, for example. So what does that data look like? Well, here we can see uh, a comparison from the Johnson and White study from several years ago. And in the colored bars here, we've got the electron probe mineral chemistry. So red for garnet, uh, green clinoproxene, purple orthoproxene, and light blue is the plagioclase for a bunch of different elements here. And the white circles represent the mineral chemistry that's come off the mineralogic intersection scan that I showed you on the previous slide. And what we can see here is that that mineral chemistry is coming out uh, very similar to, or bang on the compositions of of the previous study using WDS, so using electron microprobe. And uh, again, this is a very good example. These aren't uh, zoned minerals because we're looking at a very well equilibrated rock. Um, and what we can also pull out of that thin section scan, if we look at this right hand plot, is all of that mineral chemistry lies on a one to one line from the Zeiss mineralogic scan and the Johnson and White electron probe analyses. But in the white squares, we can also see the bulk chemistry of the rock. In this case, uh, either obtained directly from Mineralogic from the same thin section scan or from bulk rock XRF. And I've put the bulk rock chemistry here in quotation marks. We could argue a lot about uh, equilibration volumes and things like that. But this is probably a good example of the thin section being uh, a decent equilibration volume for, for the grain size that we see. And what we can see is that for both mineral chemistry and the bulk rock chemistry, we get a very nice match with, with the previous study from what we would consider our sort of 
benchmark chemistry techniques, uh, WDS for the mineral chemistry, and the whole rock XRF uh, for the bulk rock chemistry. And what can we use this for? Well, here we can see uh, two pseudo sections, uh, one of which has been produced directly from the XRF composition that came out of the Johnson and White study, and the other from the bulk composition that came out of the thin section scan in Zeiss Mineralogic. And what we can see here is that the topology of these thin sections is incredibly similar. There's a few minor differences. So some of these uh, field lines go up and down just based on the exact uh, FE number, for example. And we can see a few minor differences. So the root art inline that's visible from the original study uh, is just off the top of the, the plot on, on my bulk, uh, bulk chemistry. And there's some minor differences, uh, things like where spinel comes down, comes in down here, which we can see pinching into our peak field uh, and not on the, uh, on the mineralogic scan. But what's really important is that the peak field that we identify, so the garnet, CPX, OPX, plage, ilmenite, and magnetite, uh, essentially is absolutely identical uh, within the, uh, the limits of the instrument and the uncertainties on these plots themselves. So what we can do is, oh, excuse me, I shouldn't have automatic timings on. Um, what we can do here is basically take a single analytical data set uh, from a thin section scan on the SEM. We can pull out mineral chemistry and a bulk rock chemistry and use that uh, for, for an output that we're, we're used to doing as metamorphic petrologists and producing uh, PT pseudo sections. And one of the ideas for this will uh, now be to try and export this data in a format that we can use in programs such as X map tools which uh, have relied up until now of using a, a separate instrument uh, to get the mineral chemistry so you might get a map from the SEM and mineral chemistry from an electron probe for example whereas what we want to do is be able to pull just a single uh, EDS data set straight into XMAP tools from, from a single thin section scan. So that's a nice example um, to show you how it works really in terms of, uh, of a well equilibrated rock with, with fairly homogeneous minerals. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, minerals that aren't homogeneous, we can also use the system very neatly. Uh, so I'm going to show you some work that I'm just sort of starting to do uh, at the moment. In this case, we've got a uh, garnet. So this is a mineralogic scan just over a single mineral. And we can see the, the backscatter image on the left here and a uh, phase map on the right. So this is from the basement rocks of uh, at Glenelg. So these are the host rocks of the Glenelg uh, exergite pods. This is a garnet kyanite rutile felsic gneiss uh, in a fairly uh, high strain rock. And the EDS map, because we're pulling out for every individual pixel, the mineral chemistry, what we can do is pick out the elemental zoning that we see in the garnet. So in the case uh, of the left-hand map, we can see iron and the right-hand map, we can see calcium. And what we're seeing here is a record of, of burial of these rocks uh, from sort of mid to lower crustal conditions down to high pressure conditions uh, related to the, to the formation of those ectogite pods. So what you should be able to do here and what I want to be able to do with the software now that we've, we sort of have a, a geoscience lean within our group to, to produce things that we want to do as petrologists is to be able to you know, generate profiles across these, these minerals, these zoned minerals directly from, from the EDS data and as I said, because every one of the pixels that's in there is, is quantitative chemistry for the major elements, then we should be able to very easily from a single instrument pull apart uh, the histories that we're interested in in these kind of samples. And just another example to finish with, which is quite neat, this is uh, from a garnet schist in the Loch Lomond area. Uh, the sample comes from Owen Weller. Hi, Owen. Um, now, what we can see here is uh, the thin section, of, uh, thin section image of the garnet on the left-hand side. And on the right, again, the mineralogic map from what we've come to call Chimera maps, because they're combining two different things here. We can see for the garnet, got uh, chemical zoning, in this case in iron. And for the rest of the thin section that isn't garnet, we've just left that as the phase map. So we're combining uh, zone mm -hmm. geochemistry with, with the mineral phases that are included within that garnet. And what we can see here is, is an evolving inclusion, assembl inclusion assemblage. So in the very center of the grain, these uh, dark minerals, we can see a tourmaline, there's also cordierite in the core of these garnets. Uh, the yellow inclusions in here are ilmenite, and we can see they disappear by the time we get to the rim of the garnet, and we start to see uh, green, which is uh, apatite, and the red, uh, sorry, the dark blue rutile. So what we can see here is, is an evolving uh, geochemistry of the garnet, along with an evolving inclusion assemblage, which tells us something about our metamorphic history. 
And again, what I would like to now be able to do with this software and what we're going to hopefully take the software to do is to be able to sort of automatically generate um, information about how your inclusion assemblage is, is evolving with the geochemistry of, of the host minerals and be able to pull that directly into, into metamorphic studies for, for, for tracking metamorphic history. Uh, so that's a few uh, fairly simple examples. Uh, I think I've gone through that in a, a reasonably sensible amount of time. And so the idea is, as I said, what I want to do is kind of stimulate the, the community to come to me now that I have this role and tell me what they would like to see SEM instruments doing, what they would like uh, us to be doing as, as a company supporting GSIS departments, and what they would like to see me doing with you guys in terms of uh, collaboration and support for what's going on in departments and, and elsewhere. And thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. That was a fantastic talk with really pretty maps. Um, <laughs> so um, there are a couple of questions. Um, one is um, from, uh, from Bruna. She's asking, what's the smallest resolution of the instrument um, in, in terms of compositional maps uh, of not inclusion for our, if that is too small? So, so the instrument that I've got, which I showed at the beginning, um, so this is a field emission SEM, this is a, this is a Sigma, Sigma 300. Um, essentially, you can, you can choose a, a step size um, to create the EDS map that goes down to nanometer resolution. <laughs> but ultimately, what you're then going to do is, is have mixed um, chemistries because your adjacent pixels are going to have overlapping interaction volumes for the instrument. And we've actually been doing this deliberately for some tasks. So, so I've not worked with, with melt inclusions, for example, but um, I've recently been doing some work with someone for igneous petrology. So looking at uh, sulfide inclusions in, in olivines and, and glass and trying to get the original sulfide um, compositions in terms of iron, nickel, copper, et cetera, from what are now five or 10 micron size differentiated sulfide. So they, there's, there's multiple different sulfides in there now, and they wanted to reconstitute the compositions of the original sulfides. And so those were mapped at, at um, anything from, from half a micron down to 100 nanometers to try and get as many um, individual spots as you, as you can within the um, sulfide droplets themselves. And then you can use that chemistry to make sure that as soon as you get near the margins and you start to see silica or anything else, then you can exclude those analyses and then, and then rebuild the, the solidified compositions um, by averaging all of the, the now um, sort of immiscible sulfide compositions that have differentiated and, and, and piecing that back together again. Um, so essentially there's no limit on, well, no functional limit in terms of normal petrology uh, in terms of what you what you want to do with your with your step size it then comes down to what you're trying to achieve and whether it makes sense to have overlapping interaction volumes thank you um there was another question about how long does it take to um to get these um map phase and compositional maps because i mean some of the microbe stuff is usually uh, some a, we uh, a weekend or something so how how quick is it for for what you're doing that's a sort of open-ended question as well so um it depends how many counts you want to get for for what you're trying to achieve so to do a major element composition thin section map like the um like the scary more gabbro that i showed for a 10 micron pixel size and what i'm trying to do is get something like three thousand counts per pixel um, and that will pick up all my major elements down to about one percent uh so that will run overnight so um depending on how much of your thin section anywhere from from 12 to 24 hours um for some of the things where i care a bit more about the chemistry or if i care more about trace elements and i might want to up up those counts for example the um these maps these have a a two micron pixel size which is probably getting to a point where you're sort of functionally got your your step size and your interaction volumes um about right and just to map a single garnet like this, which is uh, about three millimeters across, might take three or four hours. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there are lots of um, other questions in the chat, uh, uh, but I think uh, we will move on now to the next talk and maybe you can uh, answer some of them. I will uh, deal with those. <laughs> Yes, great. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, and it's really uh, interesting. I think it has lots of potential.